as the Bible says, your word, let it be a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. Yeah. Today, let us not harden our hearts as we hear and listen. You know, we hear it and we listen. It's two different uh, um, interpretations. But we want to hear and listen to the word of God. And then we need to apply these words that we listen. Allow the Holy Spirit today to bring conviction, to bring truth to the word of God, that we may be set free, that we may go and be the light in this world for our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning, the title is, We No Longer Weep for Our Sins. We no longer, and that is true, we as Christians, we no longer weep for our sins, as Christians ourselves, but as we look around the world, what is happening in the world? You know, we Christians, because we call ourselves Christian, we think the world doesn't affect us. It's as all of we've gone into a time zone that when we have received that label uh, Christian, we are different. We, we, we live in a utopia world, we don't. We still live next to the ungodly neighbors. We still go to work with our unsafe colleagues. We still um, fellowship with our families that reject Jesus Christ every day. So we are still living in this world, but we are not weeping. We Christians, we do not weep. We do not grieve. So why would the world also follow our examples? There is a problem there. The church no longer is weeping for the very sins that Jesus Christ came to this earth on that cross for, to take away our sins and that of this world. Because as we know, if we read about it in Genesis, about the fall of man. And that's where sin comes in. But now the church, we, we no longer weep. We no longer grieve at the state of the world. But the world has come into the church. But the church is not a building. The church is every individual that takes up a seat in a building. Or the church is underneath a tree, standing around as it was during John Wesley's time. That was church. People that were standing or sitting or kneeling. That is the church. It is not a building. It is every individual's with emotions, with a spirit, with a soul, and with fleshly desires. So if we are no different from the world, then where is the change going to take place? And why should it? Are we happy as a church to be where we are today? Not 2,000 years ago, today, this present time, 2018, all around the world, this message it's for all the churches. It's for the Christians who sit there daily, who goes to their Bible study, who goes to their uh, cell groups. Entertainment is what's come into the church, into the believers, that they no longer see weeping and grieving for the state of their soul, for the state of the world, for the state of where they are. Oh, that's all right. Jesus has done it on the cross. We've accepted him. He's done it all. Don't worry. Let's go back into the world and live like the world. Let's celebrate. But guess what? The groom hasn't come back for the bride. And as a Christian, that should be the foremost thing in your mind that you need to understand and realize that you are the bride of Jesus Christ. And there is a groom that is missing. At which wedding has any of us gone to where the bride is at the wedding reception with the rest of the family and friends, but there is no groom. There is no groom, but there is celebration taking place. Is there a problem there? Wouldn't everyone be up in a roar, would be running and, and complaining and, 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 and crying and screaming their heads off or whatever it, all, it is? You know, on, on Facebook, uh, a, a few months ago, I saw a clipping of a bride coming down a helicopter towards her, her wedding day. But unfortunately, that helicopter crashed right in the middle of the wedding reception. 
So did the rest of the groom and everyone went off and celebrated and partied? Or were they weeping and grieving and screaming their heads off and, 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 and in panic? But what is happening to us as Christians? The sins that have entered into the church and into the believers' own lives. Don't tell me you, you blame the church, you blame the pastors, you blame the leadership as to why certain sins have crept into the, into the church. But you take those sins yourself and you take it home with it and you live, live like it. If we re-examine ourselves as Christians, why are we not forsaken? Why are we not turning away from these sins? You know, many of us think that we no longer need to weep in the house of God. We no longer need to put down those sins that God has already over and over and over have commanded us, not just only through the word of God, but when he has given us prophets, prophets of old, prophets of new, those out of street preachers out there saying it as it is. But no one is grieving. Not the leadership, not the, the congregation members. What are we doing as Christians today? Do we think that the groom is not coming back for his bride? A spotless bride. A spotless bride without staying on our garments. Why is it the church is not grieving and weeping at this hour? The Spirit of God is grieving. The Spirit of God is weeping. Jesus is interceding for us in the throne room. He is pacing up and down, interceding for a church that won't weep and grieve for the state of this world, for the state of the sin of each person that calls himself a Christian, that the world cannot see any difference in us. And that is the sad thing. When the world cannot see the difference, the world knows that we Christians join in the same very sin that God has commanded us, his children, to put away. Not to conform to the ways of this world, but be transformed in the renewing of your mind so we no longer pick up the same sins, the same way of this world, the same mindset. We need to put away because this God we serve is a holy God. And if you do not recognize that at this hour, how holy this God is, there is a highway of holiness that every man and woman and child that calls himself a Christian must be walking today. The tears are no longer flowing for each of us and for the church and for the world. We are just having too many happy hours in the house of God. We are putting the cart before the horse. Both in the leadership. The leadership has a very important responsibility in the church. But do you see a lot of leaders grieving at the state of even the church that they are shepherding over? They are not the true shepherd. It is Jesus Christ. It is not the domination. It is not the pastor, the prophet, the evangelist, or anyone else that comes to the house of God. It is the one that God has appointed. The one that God has called out as, he, as Jesus did with the 12 disciples. But the church has become cold. Don't blame the world. The church allows the world to come in through compromise, through lukewarmness. The only reason why a pastor in the beginning would object, will find that the, the homosexuality, the rise in homosexuality, not in the world, but in the church. Why a pastor would suddenly change, change its opinion, or his opinion, or her opinion, is because someone that they love themselves 
has become that. And therefore they will compromise what the word of God says. That homosexuality is an abomination to our holy God. And unless you change and repent, you will likewise perish. The pastors, the leadership need to preach it. Need to speak it as it is. Stop sugarcoating the word of God. Coming into the house of God. Defiling the very temple. But not grieving. Not crying. Not mourning. Not lamentating. Not none of those things. But entertaining the sheep of Jesus Christ. It cost a lot for Jesus to go to the cross. As Brother Corey was praying during worship. Yes, we come and we praise and we worship. We praise, we honor God because he is holy. There is many things to thank our God. But even in the beauty of our worship and our praise, we need to recognize that we are wretched souls, unworthy human beings. We, the Gentiles, we have been grafted into the family of God. So Father, we don't cry out his name. We don't cry out the name of God the Father. This message is not to tickle anyone's ears. It's to tell the child of God, the, the God-fearing Christians out there. The Bible says in Ecclesiastic, there is a time for this and a time for that. There's a time for weeping and a time for mourning, a time for rejoicing, a time for your, your birth and a time for your death. But the better part is that death because when you die, you are going to a better place and that is with Jesus Christ. And that's something to look forward to. So the only type of celebration that we as Christians should be having is when that sinner repents <coughs> of their sin and believe in Jesus Christ. But not only just believe in words, but put it into practice. Start living for Jesus Christ. Put away, put down your sins. Put the, your old former lifestyle, the way you used to think, the way you used to do things, the way you, you think that you knew it. You know, God is calling those that are foolish to this world. You know, just because you have degrees here, because you are rich here, because you are the most attractive looking person here, those things are not going to matter in the kingdom of God. It's whether you are available to be used by God and would you be a fool? Would you be separated? We sing holy, holy, holy. The word holy means separation. I see many churches, many worship leaders singing the word holy. And they are as holy as that homeless person that is crying out to be set free from where they are. You can't distinguish between what is holy and what is unholy, what is profane and what is unprofane. The Bible speaks about it. But today the church won't grieve at the state, at the mess that is happening in the side of the church itself. In Luke 15, 10, it says, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God, of one sinner who repents. When there's an altar call, and you run to that front because you are a wretched soul, you know that there is salvation was, is only through Jesus Christ. You had no other way, no other option to come out of that sin, to come out from where you were. But through Jesus Christ, you gave your life to Jesus. You repented. You were weeping. You were crying. But was that only for show? Was it only because the worship music was hyped up? Because we know what music does to the body, to the, to the flesh. We know why when we are praising and worshiping. This is a holy God. And yet there are men and women in the house of God professing, proclaiming to be true worshipers. And yet are up there defiled in the way they are dressed, the way they sing, the way they move their body. 
It is not honoring our God who is holy. There is order. There is beauty in the way you worship this King of Kings, this Lord of Lords. Unless a church recognizes that even in their worship, that if you are not weeping and crying, if you are not shaking your head and say, how can the pastor put such and such up there? Look at what they are doing. They are causing the men and the women and the young children, the young people to sin before a holy God. We cry out for the presence of God during worship and praising. He is not going to be found around what is not holy, what is not defiled, even in the sanctuary of God. If we look at Luke 18, 9, 14. I want to read this scripture. It's about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. There are many of us like this. We are, there are many self-righteous Christians. There are many going to the house of God, living a hidden life, living a life that they, they, they are okay. It's, it's the next person or it's this other person. But they don't seem to want to look at themselves first. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me, a wretched soul. How is it that I am able? Why is it that you are able to even save me? How is it that I can come to the house of God and still think? the way that this Pharisee thinks. Many of us are going to the house of God. We are not grieving, we are not weeping. When we went to the front door, that is the house of God. Have we forgotten? It is not the, 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 the pastor's church. It is not the so-and-so church. That front entrance into that temple, that sanctuary where the members come together to pray, to worship, to be fed the word of God is still the house of God. It is the temple of God. Jesus himself went into a temple. Yes, it's a physical temple, but you still must show reverence and honor. Jesus cleansed that temple because to him he recognized, this is my father's house. How dare you? How dare the women come in dressing as though they're going clubbing and the pastors and the parents and the elders and the deacons and the old generation that sits in that same church will not rebuke, will not correct, will not send them away and then return back until you realize you are in the house of God and in the midst there we cry out for the presence of God he is in that midst where two or three are gathered. If his spirit is there, just because his physical body is not there, does not mean our holy God does not dwell there. We need to honor the temple of God, not just the physical, but also that spiritual part of ours. Why are we not grieving for the state of our sins and that of the church? Firstly, and then we look at that world, that world that has crept in. So when we look at this, how is it that we do not identify ourselves as these tax collectors? You know, many of us, once we've accepted Jesus Christ, 
you know, we go on about it. We do testimonies. Oh, you know, I was lost. Then I was delivered. Then God set me free from such and such, such and such. That is awesome. That's an awesome testimony that the world needs to hear about it. But next time you check with the world and you are still in those things, you have reverted back to those things, you make a mockery of your Christianity with Jesus Christ. You nail Jesus back on that cross because that makes you a hypocrite. When you think that what this tax collector, when he could not even lower, when he all he could do was lower himself, how many of us go into the house of God bringing in cold drinks and cappuccinos, chatting away, gossiping? How many of us when we go to people's homes, do we disrespect them or do we show respect for the host and we welcome them and we sit down and we talk to them? We are in the house of God. We need to recognize that this holy God lives in that temple or doesn't he? Or does he just live outside? And that house that we, we call church is a social gathering. We bring all the sins of the world in there. We Put a few worship songs and a few praise. We dance and yippee. But then we leave those sins still with us, still in the house of God. And yet we don't grieve. We don't weep. We don't go to these people. We don't uh, uh, challenge our leadership when they are saying, no, it's okay. It's okay. You know, it's grace. Grace allows us, you know. And, and anyway, stop judging. You know, you're not a Christian if you are judging. You know, there are street preachers out there. Some of them have hardened their hearts because they have tried, they have tried, they have put signs up saying, not to the world, but to the so-called Christians that walk by and see the signs that says, fornication, that says homosexuality, that says um, adulterous, all these sins that is mentioned in the word of God. If you are telling me as a Christian that God is all about love, show me your Bible. Show me where scripture says God is love. God is love. And he will overlook your sins. He will overlook that a homosexual can come and call themselves a Christian homosexual. And yet the Bible says homosexuality. Where are their places? It's not in heaven. If you want to check at the state of the Christian of the world, you go and you check the street preachers that are happening out there in all parts of the world. You listen to what they're saying. Some of them have hardened their hearts because they know we are at an hour. That the more they go on about love, the more, you know, Christians have come up to them and been offended. You are not preaching like Jesus did. Do you know how Jesus preached? You hypocrites, you brood of vipers. Do you think those words are loving words? No, they are not. These are words that either make you feel, wow, or it will make the thing in you attack the very person. And the reason why Jesus was not attacked is because of who he is. But many of us are so self-righteous. We think that just because we've given our lives to the Lord, we can now go back into these old sins. We no longer come to the house of God with remorse. You know, we come with baggages and then we bring it in and we utilize our praise and our worship as the reason of, okay, everything's going to be good. No, that, that, that's the bonus. That's just something. That's secondary. Before you can even come before a holy God, you need to, as this tax collector, you need to recognize who you were, what you are now, and what you will be in the future. If you don't continue to repent of your sins and listening to the lies 
of the churches that you are going to that are saying that you don't need to deny yourself, that you don't need to repent, you are heaping up judgment on yourself on the day that Jesus Christ returns. And don't be surprised because the church that is only filled up with entertainment, you know, there is that saying, crocodile tears. There are, are a lot of crocodile tears taking place in the house of God. Come to the front. Give your life to God. Time how long before those tears end and you're back to your old ways. Because you know why? Because the truth, the, the undiluted gospel is not being treated with kids' gloves. Because the cost of that cross and the sins that is going to lead you to hell and everyone in that, in that church is going to hit you like a ton brick on the day the Lord comes back for you. Whether in death or when the Lord takes us in that rapture. So when we look at this tax collector, we were all like that. But many of us are now becoming like that Pharisee. We, no, 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 I'm fine. Do you need prayers? Because it looks like, you know, you're struggling. No, no, I'm good. I'm okay. I'm okay. Then you find out the, the people that they call themselves Christians, they live like the world. They operate like the world. Their mindset is like the world. They run to the ways of the world and they call themselves Christians. There was a street preacher. Unfortunately, he was preaching away from like a, a tavern, a pub, you know, preaching about, uh, uh, he, you know, drunkenness will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the people that came across to confront him were, unfortunately, Christians. Christians, not the world, not the unsaved that are wanting a solution to why they go to the pub at 6 o'clock or 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. But they were Christians. They were in the pub themselves. And they came up to the preacher and the preacher goes, you need to be saved. Oh, I'm saved. What? Are you a born again Christian? Oh, yes, I'm a born again Christian. But you just came from the tavern. Yeah, I love drinking. You were not there to preach, to, 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 to you know, bring the gospel of Jesus Christ? No. I was drinking. I love drinking. Okay, okay, lady, you're not born again. You're not saved. Oh, no, I've been saved. That's many of us Christian. I've been saved. I can speak this. I can do that. But hang a minute. You were at the pub drinking. You were, oh, but Jesus did the same. Jesus was in the pub. Really? Did Jesus main goal was to come and sit with the tax collectors and, 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 and with the sinners and be like them? Or he was here on this earth to set the captives free? We are, we are forgetting that a little bit. So this woman or this man proceeded to say, I'm born again, I'm this, I'm that. And the gentleman said, but you are a Christ follower. You're supposed to put those things down. How can you be going and being like the world? Oh, well, you know, you, you shouldn't judge. You shouldn't judge. The Bible says don't judge. They don't read the Bible. Because if you read the Bible, it says the judgment begins in the house of God. Right? And if it doesn't, wow, then we're in big trouble. Then let's pack it in and let's go and live in the world. Because when this person left, offended by what this preacher was saying, that Jesus would never have done that. He was there. He was on a mission. And if you're going to the pubs, I pray that you're going there to minister that God, that the Spirit of God has led you into that place. Not to condemn. You are not there to condemn. You are there to preach in love. But when it is another Christian saying, unless Jesus convicts me to stop drinking, then I will stop drinking. And then the, the preacher said, but what if he does convict you? What, does he, what if he says then I'll think about it? Do you see that? No. You cannot have a foot in this world yes. and a foot with God and call yourself a God fearing, born again Bible believing Christian. Amen. You cannot. 
You cannot fraternize with the enemy. Not the person, the enemy, the, 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 the spirit that is behind the homosexual. How can a born again believer say it is okay to enter into a church where they do not honor the sanctity of marriage? One man and one woman. What gospel are they preaching to the lost and to the congregation? God is not all about love. I'm telling you now. Right? I was brought up in the Catholic thinking. You don't preach. You don't share the gospel of this Jesus Christ who saved you from your sins. You put your Christianity, your whatever, in your pocket. But you live like the world. No one could recognize you. That you were set apart. That you are different for a reason and for a purpose. So if a lot of us are going and are calling ourselves Christians, we are not grieving for the state of our own sins. Oh, but, but what is sin? As that lady was saying, as many people that confront the street preachers, what is sin? What? Fornication? Is sin? Really? Yeah. The preacher. These preachers that you see on YouTube, man, the way that the Lord uses them and the way that some of them just, you know, they, they know the state that we are in. They know the people that they are around and they want to reach out to these lost people. But when it is another Christian that they are confronted with, they shake their head. They are even more more, more hard on these people. It's not the lost. It's not the unsaved. It's not the, the ones that are rejecting Jesus because of something that has happened to, to their lives. But it's actually the Christian, the so-called Christian, whether you're a Catholic, a Protestant, a Pentecostal, um, you know, Jehovah's Witness, whatever it is that you term yourself a Christian. These are the very people that are offended so much by the fact that if they don't repent, if they don't turn from their sins that goes against this holy God, there is a place for them that the Bible talks about, the lake of fire. But many of us think, no, I'll be right. If I die, I'm going to heaven. And they'll be drinking in heaven. They'll be this in heaven. They'll be nightclubbing in heaven. You know, there'll be whores in heaven. There'll be harlots. No, no. Even the harlots of this earth as we read about it, the adulterous woman. I know for a fact that in coming into contact with Jesus Christ, she would have had a 360 turn in her life, the way that she conducted herself. You now we always talk about that the encounter with Jesus Christ should bring that immediate transformation <coughs> that we no longer is a person of old. But if we're coming to a church, if we are daily, as we wake up, we recognize, wow, something is happening. The sins that I put down, I'm picking them up. And if you say that you have no sin, the Bible says you are a liar. 1 John 1, 8, 10. And you make God a liar as a Christian. So if anyone that says, oh no, I don't have a sin. Oh, well, my sin is just a little bit, you know, well, you know, I, I, I stole a, um, a, a rubber from my work, you know, but, you know, that, that, that's not, not sin. Sin is sin. If you're not grieving the fact that, you know, you stole something without asking, you cheated on your tax forms, you cheated at the shop when at McDonald's, they gave you more change than you were supposed to have and you go off going, oh, you know, I've got one for free. That's cheating, uh, stealing, lying. What else? <laughs> there are all these sins that a lot of us Christians take for, you know, take so lightly that God is going to overlook it. We don't grieve anymore. We don't grieve when a husband and wife you know, has an argument for days on, you know. And we're not grieving, we're not crying, we're not saying to the Lord, we're not going, you know. When that used to happen, I used to run away from God. Because I know that if I went to God, I'm going to have to cry and weep and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. But the church won't even do 
do that now that our past is having more than one marriage and you know they're all in the same room and it's okay because God is love God is forgiving in James 1 4 it says without sin each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and when that desire is conceived it gives birth to sin and when it is fully grown it leads to death we know that the wages of sin is death but only through repentance only through what godly sorrow 2 Corinthians 7 10 godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation not to be regretted but the sorrow of this world leads to death I call it the worldly weeping versus the godly heart wrenching weeping weeping so much weeping for your marriage that at the end you've just got no energy you know, when the devil was putting my own marriage through the mill, how prior to that I was like, oh, whatever, if, that, if that's God's will, the marriage, no, 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 no. When you run to the word of God, it says divorce is hardness against a God, a holy God. When I went on my knees and I cried and I cried and I cried, until there was no more tears left because I know what would happen if I went through with that divorce if I went through and said I don't want that anymore because the one that I would hurt for foremost is <coughs> my God my marriage then my children and anyone else that is affected so unless we are grieving for the state of our own sins that does affect us we think it doesn't but sin if not confronted whatever it is whether small or big in the church that sin will grow it will be like a cancer and without recognizing without going as the the, the, the tax collector did in the house of God but we don't need to come to the house of God in our own time when we have taken up a sin that we know oh Lord you know others may not see this but you do we know we are grieving the Holy Spirit we know it upsets our children when they see parents calling themselves Christians but drinking until they are drunk you know having a fridge full of alcohol instead of food to feed the children trusting in the ways of this world for finance you know many of us we trust in one powerball and we're out of here but how many of us after coming after accepting Jesus Christ know that Jesus Christ is the one that provides both for our finance, both for our, our, all of our needs actually. All of our needs come from heaven above. If we read about the journey of the children of Israel, you know, I read in, I think it was in, yeah, in Exodus after uh, the Red Sea, how the shoes were not worn out. The food was always coming, it was always plenty. But did you know, they just complained. There was none of this, oh Lord, thank you so much for that food. Thank you so much for the, 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 the shoes that are not worn out. They forgot about their sins of complaining, constant whining. Oh gosh, you know, it's as though like if God was a Buddha with that, you know, the big belly that we see in news agents, everyone goes and robs it. And it's encouraged to be robbed. Oh, if you rub it, you might win the next lotto. And when some people do, it's like, you see, see, turn to Buddha, be, become a Buddhist or whatever religion out there to gain what you can gain it freely 
if you wait upon God. You know, we're worrying about things that the world worries about. But we have a God who knows what his children need, not want. We don't need a one point, oh no, no, it wasn't a one point, a $56 million jet. Where are we going? Where are we going? Which people? Going to heaven. Well, you won't make it that far. You know, unfortunately, if you are supporting ministries and people of God that think this is the way to God, through love, love, through prosperity. Yes, God wants to bless us as he did Abraham, Isaac, and, and David. He blessed Esther. But there are certain things that we need to do. Let's look what happened to Solomon. In all the riches, he did not grieve for what was to take place. His life, it says towards, is that he turned away from God. The people, the women, the world turned Solomon away. Even though he walked with God, he had um, encounters with God. God appeared before him. If my people who will humble themselves and seek, King Solomon had wisdom and knowledge. He had wealth beyond anything, but he did not grieve at his relationship with God and where it was leading him to hell. Many Christians today, we are not grieving for our own sins, but those our neighbor, knowing that our neighbor, knowing that the pastor is in a sexual sin, but we keep quiet about it. No, 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 we can't judge. Let the Spirit of God judge. But again, you are heaping judgment for yourself and for the very one who is committing this act. If you don't tell, if someone asks you, as they ask the street preacher, I'm gay, will I go to hell? If you continue in the practice of homosexuality, you will die in your sins and you will not be with God. That's right. You must stop those practices. You can call yourself gay, but you cannot partake in that sin. If you are fornicating and a preacher says, are you living in that place with that person and you are not married, and if you say yes, then you need to separate because that is fornication and God will not take that sin lightly. If you are in sexual sin with another man's wife and you use race to justify where you are in your sin, you need to put that woman or that man away and run to your spouse and ask for forgiveness and ask God to help because you don't know how that partner is going to react. So you need all the grace of God and the mercy of God before you tackle that. If there are preachers up there saying certain things that you know, hang a minute, why do we need my money, so much money to build more buildings when there are orphans and widows, there are the, the, uh, the mission field needs the money. When someone is saying, give, you know, so me because God said that I need that special jet. I need that special oil. What I've realized, the revelation that should jump to born again Christians that read the word of God, that no jet, no man, no woman, no pastor, no preacher is here to save you. No anointing oil, no pool of Bethesda will heal you 
will save you. That scripture, if you read it, although the crippled man, he wanted an opportunity to get into that pool. He couldn't. He couldn't and no one was willing to help him until Jesus Christ came and said to him, but then did Jesus Christ say, hey, let me lift you up and put you in the pool? Did he say that? He didn't say that. So it wasn't the water that brought healing to that man. Of course, as Brother Matt was saying, faith. When Jesus says, be healed, that man had no longer need of that pool. He got up and what did he do? He went to the temple rejoicing, glorifying. But Jesus saw him at the temple and says, you know, like, go and see no more, lest a worse thing fall on you. Go and see no more. And so it is with us. Why do we continue to keep up judgment on ourselves when we don't understand that the sins that God sent Jesus Christ to pay for is gone, is at the back burner, is under our feet. When the enemy is attacking us, is attacking the church with new doctrines, with false teaching, we need to put that spirit, that evil spirit under our feet and then we can celebrate and rejoice because we are stamping on God's enemy who says, bring all these false doctrines, bring all these false teachings, bring all these false errors into the house of God because when they get fed, they then take it on board and go home and they live this false doctrine, this false teaching, and then what happens? We then it becomes a ripple effect. Then the Christian goes to work, then affects that unworldly, ungodly person who then turns it around and says, that's right, brother and sister, I love your church. You allow gay at the worship. You allow your, your pastor to be gay. Yes, he's got his madam standing up there praying with you, laying his hand on you. That is acceptable. That is because the false doctrines, the false um, uh, teaching and all that becomes a ripple of that. It's a domino of that. The laying of hands. Be wary of those who lay hands on you. So if you take what you are fed in the house of God by supposedly God-fearing men and women and you take it on board, on board and you go amen to a 56 million jet when the money could be used for other things, and then you are offended by the gospel of Jesus Christ that came to this world to save you, to deliver you, to heal you, to restore you, to, bring, to give you back what the devil and the world have taken from you. He's taking peace. He's taken his, he's reduced you to just a sniveling, no impact, no authority, Christian, because you are just like the world. You've taken up that false doctrine, that, that, that junk food that you have been fed in, in supposedly the house of God. You've taken it to the world and you are feeding the world with the same junk that God came with Jesus Christ to set us free so that the world knows that what we have, they want it so desperately. So why are we not on our knees grieving and weeping? But we are not. We are dancing. We are who boo shaking our booties. We are not in a worldly party. We are in the midst of angels that we do not see supernaturally. But we should know that they are there. We should know that when we are out there preaching, we are covered by a fire from heaven. But we want that same fire. God is our consuming fire. We want that fire to be in us. So that we come to the presence of God. Isaiah 6 says, Woe to me, for I am undone. Where is the grieving in the church when you walk into the house of God? If you felt the Spirit of God, if it is saturated with so much love, then why aren't you weeping for your sins? Why are you not on your knees groveling to this God? Lord, have mercy. Judgment is coming. 
to the house of God. And if you are not awake, if you are not bolted out of your seat and get on your knees and realize that the fire, house is on fire, but many of us in the house of God are saying, it's not my house. Why should I have put the fire out? Because maybe your house is on fire. You're too busy with the other person's house on fire. You've forgotten your own. And while your house is burning, while your church is burning, the world loves you. They're not going to offer you that bucket of water. They don't care. They don't care that you have chosen to leave, uh, leave and lead a righteous life. Because we know who our God is. Well, we are supposed to. Many of us, we don't want to. You know, the, the woman with the alabaster box in Luke 7, you know, in, in Luke 7, 37, when she came into the house, what did she do? She got on her knees. She took out that perfume. She anointed. This is a sinner. Anointed the Lord's feet. Then her hair wiped his feet. But around him, self-righteous so-called men. What a waste. What is this woman doing? This woman should be like all of us. Even when we come to the house of God or even in our own time. Many of us are hearing the voice of God about prosperity, about the pursuit of happiness. But we turn a deaf ear when God is saying, Stop what you are doing. You come to the house of God. You prophesy in my name. You say this. You say that. But I'll give you Jeremiah. Seven. This is what God says to Jeremiah. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim that this word. Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the strangers, the fatherless, and the widow, and you do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to your herd, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave your fathers forever and ever. But let's read in 9. Well, 8 as well. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods with whom you do not know? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say we are delivered to do all these abominations. Many of us, are lifting our hearts to idols. And yet we come to the house of God. We call ourselves Christians. But we won't repent. We won't grieve. We won't cry out to God, have mercy upon me. That is Psalm 51. When David, when he was caught in adultery, and Nathan, came, the prophet Nathan came. He thought, hang a minute, who is this person? Yes, yes, we should kill that person. 
Hang a minute, David. It's you. But did he say, oh, away with the prophet Nathan's head? No. Have mercy upon me, O oh God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. You know, blot out my transgressions, because my sin is like the world. The sin of the world has become my sin. I thought I gave up those sins when I said, I confess with my mouth and I believe with my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. But I have picked up those old sins. I've been tempted by the world. I have no friends anymore. But my old friends have come and taken me. I'm now with them. I joke with them. Crude jokes. I do everything like the world. And I'm supposed to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. Is there any hope? Yes, there is. Put down. Amend your ways. There are many preachers like Jeremiah. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He couldn't help, he can't help himself. But many of us, we must become weeping prophets. Weeping men and women of God to weep for the state of this world, the state of the church. But we're not. We're so in of ourselves. We're so busy with the things of this world, building up our treasures on this earth. And we've forgotten. The lost are getting lost. They're rejecting Jesus Christ. The only way you want to know that this is true is when you go to the streets, any of your streets in America, in Canada, in Australia, Melbourne, Sydney, Europe, Africa. There are men and women on the line. Men are wearing sackcloth, Sackcloth is not something of fashion. It is not a runway fashion. Why people, men and women of God, wear sackcloth and ashes? Because they are grieving for the church. They are grieving for the state of the soul of every man and woman out there that call themselves a Christian but live like the world, not realizing what it costs for Jesus Christ. If you read the power, the power of the Bible, Isaiah 53 talks about the sin-bearing servant. Read about the face of Jesus Christ, what he went through on that cross. That it is not the passion of the cross that brings up your emotions to say, oh Lord, forgive me. No, it is the cross. If you keep your eyes centered on Jesus Christ as though he is still on that cross, because we know he no longer is on that cross, but if he was still on that cross, is when you need it the most, when that sin creeps in, and you realize this Jesus went to be slaughtered like a lamb. He uttered not a word, and it pleased God. Which sort of a God, I've heard of other religions says, which sort of a God allows their son to die? But our religion says why Jesus went, that God himself was pleased because Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who came and took away our sins. So if your sins have been taken away, then why do you love it so much to bring it back? Gossiping is a sin. Constant complaining is a sin. Laziness is a sin. Gluttony is a sin. Greed is a sin. These things will keep you separated from a holy God. Wake up, church. Little sin and big sin. To God, it is sin. It will separate you from God. And what man and woman that says that you don't need to repent, you don't need to, you know, j just sugarcoat it. You are in big trouble. You need to re-examine your walk 
as a Christian and as a member of the body of Christ in the, in, in the community because we should have a greater impact on the world more than the world is having it on us. So if the church that you go to, all they seem to be focused on is, you know, the, the fancy worship, you know, the, the, the fancy equipment, but the word is not preached in its fullness. That there is no weeping, there is no crying, there is no turning from your sins. But everyone stand up and applause this man and this woman. I really shake my head. Because the day the judgment day comes, you will be taken by surprise. Don't blame, don't point your finger at your pastor, at the church, at the world, at the government. That finger is going to come back to you and you will have to account. But the Bible says in James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So what do we need to do as Christians? The more we draw near to this God who is holy, the more we need to realize, ooh, that thing that I've been doing, that thing that I've been picking up and thinking that God doesn't see it, you know, what do we need to do? The more we draw near to, go, to, to God, it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. You know, these are strong words. You know, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. There is a time, there is a time under the sun for when we will rejoice and when we will celebrate. Yes, during our time of praising and worshipping, we thank God that He saw fit to send us His Son, Jesus. But that through repentance, through us saying sorry, we can come boldly to the throne room and seek those things. You know, God's mercy endures forever. God will never bestow grace on the wicked. The prayers of the wicked, God will not hear. So you can rant and rave and be offended by the cross that has been preached out there by street preachers, that's been preached by certain churches. God is coming for the remnant. Your church and you yourself as a Christian, are you fearing God? Are you grieving for the state for the soul of you and your loved ones and the world. Don't worry about looking to America. Don't worry about looking to the, the president for your answers. Don't be in fear of what is to come. Fear the one who will take both your spirit, your soul, and your, your flesh to hell. And there is no escape from that. And that is the reality. You want to hear sugarcoating preaching? It's not going to happen at this hour. If you are in a church that is sugarcoating the word of God, then run from those churches. Run. God has now got modern technology, YouTube, Facebook, whatever means that you need to run and seek after the things of God, the things that's going to draw you closer to God. And one way is you can do this. Go into your room in your prayer time. Stop giving God a list of what He can do and what. You know, don't click God ain't going to jump. All right? Go to God in humility, in reverence, with tears, with brokenness, with a contrite heart and a spirit. Allow the Spirit of God to show you. You know, enough of the, the prophecies of this and this and that. Even you yourself, at the day of judgment, are you right with God? And if you're not, all the prophecies that you were saying to every church out there, to every man and woman, and you did not take that on board yourself, again, you are in big trouble. So I can go on, but as much as people are saying, that this message may be a bit too hard. I'm sorry, but you know, I'm following Jesus Christ. I'm not here to tickle your ears because 
that as the Bible says in Luke, if one sinner repents, you know, a Christian that is constantly, constantly, continually in their sin, thinking they have no way out, they need to take a very big step backward and look at this cross yes. and look at what that cross should represent to you. And everything that the world has placed on you should have been put at the feet of that cross, at the feet of Jesus Christ. Don't approach your relationship with Jesus Christ the ways of the world. It is not religion. As much as a lot of us say it's a relationship, I even question that. If you know what I wrote, the word relationship is, then you will invest your time because sin is separation from a holy God. And we know God is holy. He's mentioned it. He's mentioned it many, many times. In, in, in 1 Peter 7, you know, without holiness, no man will see God. So if you continue in your sins, you are not grieving over your sins. You don't you think that you, you, you are above your sins, then you need to repent more. You need to repent more. You need to look at the sins. Write them down. Check it. Use the Bible as a checking point. Okay, well, where, where does it say that drinking is not a sin? Drinking, it says, can be used for medicinal purposes. But when you are overly drinking it, when you're reading that says over 0 0.07 something, and the police pick you up, I think as a born-again Christian, you can't justify that drinking for medicinal purposes not to drink that you are not sober on the day you know you've got to evaluate you've got to line up the word of God with what it is saying to the way you are living your life and if it's not there is always hope God is not in the business of condemnation but if you are in the spirit and you are of Jesus Christ, you need to reevaluate. You know, you need to reevaluate every aspect of your walk with Jesus Christ. Don't let anything be unturned. The very thing that you think God is going to overlook, He's going to bring it first to your attention. Father God, we thank you for your word. We know what is happening in the churches. We know what is happening to ourselves. We know this. Many people that have rejected to come to you, they have been offended by the cross. You know, instead of running to the cross, they see it as condemning them. Saying that this God is this and God, this God is that. No, Jesus has come, has come to set us free. He wants to set you free from the burdens of this world. He wants you to release all those burdens, all those sins, all those temptations that the world has thrown into the church, the sins. You know, the Bible says that when homosexuality, when there is a rise in homosexuality, we are at the end the very thing that holds precious to our Lord is the very thing that we no longer grieve the cross we no longer grieve but Father God we know there is always hope we need to get on our knees we need to repent we need to cry out to Jesus Christ we know, Lord, your word that says in John 2, 12, Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. So rent your heart and not your garments. Today, Father God, your word is a two-edged sword. It is a chisel and a hammer. It is supposed to break the fleshly desires in us as Christians. 
we are forgotten that we are sinners and we will remain sinners if it wasn't for Jesus Christ and what was paid on that cross we need to show love yes but we need to speak truth oh Lord let those that hear with their spiritual ears get on their knees right now and repent and deny this world to gain that with you Jesus that our Lord Jesus is coming back as much as we don't want him to come back for some of us he is coming back and that's something to rejoice and so it is angels in heaven are rejoicing when a sinner can get on their knees can repent when a church revival won't take place unless repentance takes place for the wretched souls that we are but father god you gave us jesus christ we acknowledge you as our lord and our savior as our king as our messiah as we go forth let us remember that Jesus Christ is on show and we need to show this light to this world to our families and as becoming true believers we need to fear this God so if there's anyone out there who doesn't think they don't need to repent because it's only by grace get on your knees repent if not for you, but for also the church you're at. Repent and grieve for your families that don't think they need to be saved. For the strangers on the, on, the, on the streets who says that they don't need God because they are God. We all need a savior. We all need to be saved. So this morning I pray, harden not your hearts Harden not your heart and receive the word of God this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.